I, I've had a long uh, relationship with, with DARPA and with a lot of the folks in this room, and, and one of the important things about DARPA is how uh, they help you and encourage you to think big. You know, so much, of course, a lot of us want to do that, do do that, but so much about the world tends to squelch that down in many ways, and, and it's the interaction with DARPA that's really helped us uh, to think uh, in the way we wanted to, and even pushed us to think uh, even a little bit or a lot farther than we have in the past. So it's been a really uh, wonderful relationship, and I'm grateful for the support. We have a lot of uh, exciting things, though, that it seems like we're still exponentially rising beyond uh, uh, where we've been, and uh, I'll give you a taste of that, uh, where things are going. Uh, you know, we, the, the brain is complicated, as we all know. Uh, the human brain, nearly intractable in terms of its complexity and its inaccessibility. Uh, one thing that we were known for, and, and some of our early work with uh, uh, DARPA had to do with uh, something called optogenetics, which is a way we can play in patterns of activity through fiber optics and turn individual neurons on or off in freely behaving animals. And this has become part of an effort to try to build better prosthetics and uh, work in the repair program, for example, was part of this. But uh, new directions uh, involve uh, being able to fly in and look at the detailed wiring of the brain without taking it apart and to see uh, patterns of activity uh, that relate to and can be registered to those uh, wiring diagrams. And I'll tell you a little bit about uh, how those work. Now, we, uh, you know, optogenetics, uh, exciting. It's a way of taking this limitation of electrodes that cannot distinguish different kinds of cells that are nearby and turning it into a more precise tool, uh, playing in uh, patterns of activity to neurons that are expressing a particular kind of protein, a light-activated regulator of ion flow. These are called opsins. We can control positive ion influx with blue light. We can control negative ion influx with yellow light, turn neurons uh, on or off with millisecond precision in a targeted fashion. Because these are individual genes, we can target them using genetic tricks to particular kinds of cells. And we started this work back in 2005. This uh, was the moment when we finally knew it was really going to work. This was in 2007. This is a mouse where we have a fiber optic playing in a pattern to the right side of its brain, starting here. And it starts turning left. Uh, we're playing an activity pattern into motor cortex. And this mouse, uh, without knowing why, suddenly really wants to turn left. And we'll keep turning left. And here we've turned off the light, and it immediately stops. And, and is not distressed. Uh, there's no heart rate change, no respiratory rate change. It simply went from not wanting to turn left to turning left and then to, to not wanting to again. And that uh, sort of moment was when we thought, well, this, uh, this sort of control could be very important for understanding how the brain works uh, and modulating it in health and disease uh, with a lot of uh, uh, applications and opportunities. Now, that was 2007. What NeuroFast is, is a program that's been running for about a year, and we're a performer in that. And uh, my uh, uh, colleague, Krishna Shinoy, a, uh, a renowned primate researcher, is part of that program. And what we're trying to do is take that element of uh, causality of components and behavior that I just showed you and bring that together with three other key data streams. Uh, what are those components exactly? What kind of neuron is it? Does it is it a modulator? Does it turn neurons on or off? in synaptic connections? How is it wired locally and globally across the brain? And what is it normally doing in behavior? What's the natural role? Okay, And these are three completely separate data streams that we want to register all together in the same brain at the same time, and even do this in primates, even humans, to the extent that we can. And that's an example of how DARPA has really helped uh, enable us and push us to think big. This is an example of how this works. Uh, there actually is a little mouse right here, Okay, and then about a ton of equipment here. This is a, a theater that plays a virtual reality uh, movie for the mouse. And we can keep the mouse head fixed, do very complex microscopies while it's responding to its environment, running on a floating ball, uh, licking a sucrose solution or not, so it can report back on its internal cognitive states uh, as a result of that. And what we find is here it is running. There are different contexts being played. This is a mouse that's learned that it has to freeze and start, start licking in a particular context. Uh, which is this one here, and so it's licking. But while we're doing this, so we know what the animal's thinking because it's licking only in this context that's been trained to recognize, so we know it knows it's in a particular spot and it's doing something. But while all this is happening, we're recording in three-dimensional volumes hundreds of neurons in real time observing the activity of these cells using a kind of uh, imaging, not yet published, called Swift 3D imaging. 
And here is the XY, each of these glowing blobs is a neuron, but we can see in different uh, uh, planes actually depth as well. So three-dimensional volumes, uh, hundreds of neurons. And uh, the goal is now, these are just flashing lights, so that's of some value, but we'd like to now take this and look at the detailed wiring. What are those cells? When this burst happens here, what initiated that? Which kind of cell with what projections and connections was initiating that? And that uh, is the essence of the problem. How can we register all these data sets in the same individual at the same time? Now, how are we going to get the wiring? This is the other interesting aspect. It's really hard to get wiring from intact brains. Evolution has worked really hard in some animals to create transparency, but it's very hard to make the central nervous system transparent. This is due to scattering. You could not create a more dense network of lipid water interfaces in the brain, and this is fundamental to its function. That's why it scatters, and that's why you can't make it transparent, at least in the living state. But we've been able to take uh, brains after life and make them transparent. This, there actually is a brain here. Uh, and we do this by creating a hydrogel in place within the brain, building a very dense network of nanoporous hydrophilic uh, scaffolds that's covalently linked to the brain tissue and all the amine-containing proteins in the tissue, locking those into place at the ultrastructural scale, and then removing all the lipids in a non-destructive way now that we've transformed the brain into this new uh, state. And then it becomes uh, transparent. And we call this uh, clarity. This is a mouse brain. Uh, it's about six by nine millimeters in the dimension you're looking at. But you can, without taking it apart, this is not a simulation after slicing and reconstruction. This actually is focusing through and looking around. Uh, this is a, a brain in which the yellow label picks up long-range projecting neurons. Uh, it's uh, a, a label that uh, picks up neurons that are engaged in this uh, across-brain communication. We're flying into the hippocampus here. This is a part of the brain that's involved in memory and affective state regulation. And now we're looking up to the cerebral cortex. This, these are the layer five neurons that play a big role in executive function and the uh, uh, output uh, control of behavior. And you can see this characteristic three-dimensional arrangement of cells. And what we're finding is we can register those data sets to the activity data sets that we saw in the same animal during life. Okay? And so that's how we're making this leap from what the cells were normally doing uh, to uh, how they're wired and connected across the brain uh, after life. And so that's the essence of, the, uh, of the, the challenge we face and the opportunity. But you know, one exciting thing is, can we do this not only in mouse, but can we do it in primates and even humans? And this is uh, squirrel monkey brains that we put the clarity process, uh, brought it to bear. And we can see uh, through these uh, chunks of squirrel monkey brains. And that's uh, been a big step. It takes a little longer. There's a lot more myelin, a lot more fat in the primate tissue. And we had to tweak some of the protocols. But bottom line, it works. We can see through that. And the goal here now, and here's where the wonderful collaboration with Christian Chinois is so important, is we're setting up now uh, to do the imaging that I'm talking about in a behaving macaque where it's doing a very high level cognitive task. Uh, we want to observe these neurons and their activity and then to do that clarity uh, uh, step and to see the key neurons that we know what they were doing in that individual. Uh, how are those wired up? What kind of cell is that? Uh, and that, uh, just as an engineer might want to look at a circuit diagram and understand it at that level, we think we can do that now for the brain. And we can stain with different molecular labels. That's a key feature of clarity is it allows antibodies and DNA probes to get in. And so we can not only see wiring, but we can assess the uh, type of cell uh, that is present. In this case, a parvalbumin neuron, a label for an inhibitory kind of uh, interneuron. And here's one of the most exciting things we can actually see in human brains uh, patterns of activity. This is uh, using this SWIFT 3D method. And again, similar principle, we're in a uh, uh, XY plane and looking in depth, and we can see these bursts of activity. This is a piece of tissue taken out of a living human being. It's still alive. Uh, this is a, after an epilepsy surgery, so it's uh, uh, no harm to the patient, uh, but a, a great opportunity. And as a result of that, we're now applying clarity to this as well, and we're able to look and see the uh, uh, wiring and the cell types that are associated with activity patterns in the human tissue. So that's a brief uh, a view of what the NeuroFast program is. And I'm, again, I'm uh, just uh, excited to share it with you and, and very grateful to the support. We have a very talented group of people here. I want to thank uh, R.T. Prabhakar and Jeff Ling, Justin Sanchez, the whole team, Dave Clifford, and everyone else, everyone in Krishna Shinoi's lab and everyone in my lab, and in collaboration with Manish Shah Sahani, who's helping us with a lot of the computational uh, challenges. So that's it. Thank you.